Welcome back to Shattering Mist. Before we turn our attention to um, Paul's letters and pick up where we had uh, left off, uh, Glenn has a comment about uh, Kaepernick. Kaepernick is um, <laughs> uh, a term that is used to uh, to describe uh, Mr. Kaepernick when he uh, he uh, is involved in good play and he uh, kisses his bicep and flexes his uh, his muscles and it's. It's uh, called Kaepernick, in which, if I were a 49er fan, I would love, but since I'm not a 49er fan, I I don't love it. But, Glenn, I, I'm sure you're not calling to comment on Kaepernick. Uh, no, no, no. Just uh, wanted to point out about the uh, Lady Messiah thing. Yes. Was calling herself Jesus. Uh, that mm-hmm. could have been an issue. Um, you know, if, if I had come upon that as a law enforcement official or an hero mm-hmm. person, um, I would have been pulling some blood and checking for day rape drugs because mm-hmm. she had been smoking exactly. something and then blacked out. Yes. So she had been split the Mickey in some a liquid and then become hypoxic from smoking. You know, that made her. You know, we're, we're tending to put all the onus on her. So there could have been a day rape drug involved there. Absolutely. No, that's what. That's why I was trying to say that uh, that we can't accuse uh, Kaepernick or the others that were there in his posse of uh, potentially uh, uh, doing that, because we we don't know. But but uh, uh, my, yeah, my my point really was there is there is no good explanation for what a a naked woman claiming to be Jesus is doing in your uh, hotel room bed, uh, and uh, and they go from from really bad, uh, which is my my. My situation, if I were evaluating this, the first thing that I would think is that, well, this is, this is a woman that we want to check for date rape drugs because this does not look good. Uh, uh, and then the, the second, and so that, and that would be that it, then you got rape. Um, the second is that if your need for sex is so great, that you would bring a woman who is obviously unbalanced, um, who has got some kind of a disability, into your room uh, to, uh, uh, for whatever entertainment purposes she may have been there. There's something seriously wrong with you. That's yeah. why I'm saying there, is, there are the justifications for being in that situation go from bad to horrible. Right, exactly. There's just, yeah, uh, there's just no way to make it work. There is no way to make that one work. Uh, and uh, if I were in law enforcement, I would have done exactly what uh, uh, you did. Although I'm not uh, sure that you always have that. Uh, that you can always do that. I mean, it may you may need the woman's consent, and she may have been so out of her mind that she wouldn't have given her consent. Well, then if she's if she's um, it, well here in Pennsylvania they call it three and two. If someone's um, that. Uh, out of it, then they can be, you know, voluntarily confined against the will for 72 hour, hour period of absence. Oh, okay. All right. And, yeah, well, and, yeah, this, then, this, this probably would have qualified for that. I won't leave the hotel room yeah, she, naked in the bed claiming to be Jesus. That might have, you know, that, I, if that doesn't qualify, I don't know what does. But again, yeah, um, here, this was in Florida. I don't know what, you know, if, you know, Florida does have this stand your, uh, your ground uh, law, and maybe that's what she thought she was doing. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, definitely, uh, yeah, that's, and the interesting thing about the 72 hours is, you know, it gives time for medical testing, letting it wear off, you know, counseling, family, et cetera, et cetera, and, and then damage control, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alrighty, that's all, you know, I wanted to add, really, you know, yeah. instead of, uh, yeah, just you know, allowing all of the onus to be on her because we don't know. You know, like you said, we don't know. No. Oh no, I was. Uh, I'm glad you called because that was that was not my intent. That wasn't our intent. Uh, the intent is just to say that there are no good ways out of this situation, and uh, and whether the woman was insane and or mentally handicapped or drugged, it, or the drunk, there's still there's no good excuses here for anybody. Yeah, I always, yeah, oh, it always seems to me that naked chicken gets vilified. You know, it's just yeah. Anyway. Yeah, don't don't leave a naked chicken in your uh, in your hotel bedroom. Well, it's delusional. Look what they did! To, look what happened to Chawa. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty pretty sad. 
and then yep. you know, the education thing, and then you know, you know, I had to make them, you know, give them skins for clothing. Anyway, yeah. right, I'm, I'm done being annoying. Okay, um, all right. I'll, I'll sit on the side and listen. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. I'm, it's hard to make the transition between the naked woman in the bed and uh, in Chawa, the uh, the actual name for Eve in the uh, in the garden being naked. But uh, Glenn, you've managed to uh, to do it. All right. Uh, uh, Yosha uh, told us how we are to deal with um, uh, temptation. Uh, and that temptation could be directly from Satan, as it was in his case, or it could be the temptation to participate in uh, a religion. It could be the temptation to be, uh, to be engaged in, uh, in some, uh, uh, something that is in, in conflict with uh, Yahweh. It might just be the decision as to whether or not I should accept what somebody is saying as true or not. And so here is uh, is Yosha. He's out in the uh, the wilderness. This is uh, from Matinya 4:4. This is before he has begun his ministry. This is immediately before his uh, um, public declaration, which is called the Sermon on the Mount, which is his teaching on the uh, the mount. And uh, it reads as follows. But then the one having become the answer. Uh, this is a very interesting word. It's apo Um It means that that this is the one who helps us separate fact from fiction, the one who helps us distinguish from the truth from dis- uh, deceit. Now, he did not speak Greek here, so we can't make too big a deal of the, uh, of the Greek. It's a translation of the discussion which was in Hebrew. But uh, nonetheless, uh, apo uh, means to separate, and krino means to separate a grant again. So, you know, when you read the passage in English, you know, judge not lest you be judged, um, judged is from crino, and crino actually means separate. So it, the, the actual passage is uh, don't separate or you will be separated. Uh, it goes from being uh, contradictory to the discussion uh, that it is uh, uh, used in where Yosha is being judgmental of uh, the advocates of religion and politics to making sense, which is that religion and politics separate uh, men and women from God. And if you use, uh, deploy religion and politics to separate uh, souls from God, then you will be separated from God. So it goes from being in conflict with what's in the discussion to being consistent with it when you translate crino appropriately. Apple crino would be, apple means to separate, and crino means to separate, and so you've got uh, separation upon separation. And um, the, the inference here is that uh, Yosha is a, can be used as a means to, uh, to make this kind of separation. You know, he, he told us that he did not come to bring peace, but it's instead division. And he even went on to say that, you know, that, that put people on the side relative to him will, desire, will divide um, families. And it's true. Um, the, the whole concept of cutting the covenant and of uh, us choosing uh, by our own volition to be either cut into the covenant or cut out of the covenant is uh, speaks of this. But it also um, speaks to the process of determining what is of God and what is not of God. And if you want to know what is of God versus what's not of God, you want to be able to separate the two. That which is reliable from that which is not, which is the whole purpose of reviewing Paul's letters, is to determine whether or not they should be separated from that which is God, or I uh, include it from what is of God. Then this combination of apo and crino is a is an interesting term. So, but so the, going back to the beginning. But then the one having become the answer, uh, having provided the means to separate fact from fiction, said, It has been written, not upon bread alone, by itself, without help, from monos, will this man assuredly live, but upon every spoken statement departing through the mouth of Yahweh. Now, it is interesting that the term for bread, artos, is a 
baked loaf of bread with yeast, which aerates. Uh, the food in general uh, is uh, speaks of aerated fr- food. It is artos is from aero. Aero is the Greek word that we transliterate the English word hair, and it means to rise up from the ground. Um, and so this bread, the Greek term, is specifically yeasted bread. And so Yosha is telling us, no, I can't consume the yeast, which he defines as political and religious corruption. If I did that, if I'm consuming the yeast, then, uh, then I'm corrupting myself. And no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, the whole purpose is for me to be matzah, for me to be unyeasted bread, so that I can fulfill the promise of matzah. And uh, rather than explain the logic of it, which would have been a perfectly appropriate thing for Yahusha to do, uh, just as I have done for you here, Yahusha took a different tactic. And the tactic he took is one that we should take which is that he said uh, that not upon uh, bread alone, uh, by itself, without help, would this man surely live, but upon every spoken statement departing out of the mouth of Yahweh. What he did is he actually cited a, uh, the Torah. And, and so he went beyond simply giving the rationale for his decision, he said that he's, he's saying that God's answers are the answers that matter. Now, while God's answer happened to be consistent with the, the rationale that I've shared with you, the only irrefutable uh, source is Yahweh's testimony. And that's why Yosha cited it. And that's why it's, it's so troubling when we have um, discussions with the advocates of either Hebrew roots or uh, Christianity. And they, when confronted with Yahweh's testimony, when uh, we do what Yahusha did here, which is to quote the Torah to explain why the religious position is inappropriate, that Rather than say, wow, that is the irrefutable, always dependable source of evidence, I stand corrected, almost always they did what Satan even wouldn't do, which is to question the resource, to discard Yah's testimony. Yes, you see, when we studied this testimony, we found that Yahusha became the answer by quoting the Torah. If you want the antidote for being misled, if you want to discern that which is true from that which is not false, cite the Torah. It is the answer every time. It's why when people uh, say, you know, I received a letter today, someone saying, um, you know, what do you think about the book of Enoch? And any time I see that, I say, oh, boy, uh, there's somebody that has been uh, misled into thinking there's different times to celebrate the invitations to meet with Yahweh because of the different calendar that's presented in Enoch. And my uh, answer is always the same. Uh, Yahweh gives us a very um, succinct means to determine what he has inspired and what he hasn't. He says that what I have inspired will include prophecy, and the prophecy will be uh, always uh, accurate. What I inspired will be wholly consistent with my testimony. And if you find an inconsistency with my testimony, then it's not for me. You can apply the test. It's uh, presented in Devadium 13 and the 18th uh, chapter. And uh, Enoch fails that test. Um, uh, and... All you have to do is look at the fact that uh, Enoch was uh, put together in the second century BCE, long after the last of the prophetic books were uh, revealed, uh, and that it is a fraud. It's not attributable to Enoch. Enoch, the individual Enoch, didn't write a book, and we have nothing from him. And so it's a, it's a deliberate fraud. Um, and the, all you have to do is apply the test. 
and you'll know that that is the case. Well, that's what Yosha did, and he did it constantly. He was constantly citing the uh, Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. Uh, right now, I'm I'm doing a review of Daniel, uh, Daniel 7, 8, and 9. And what you find is that virtually all of it makes its way into the later chapters of Revelation, all the way from Revelation 12 through Revelation 19, is an explanation of, uh, of Daniel 7, 8, and 9. Uh, about the nature of the beast. And, and it's very much like uh, at the end of, uh, of chapter 8 of Daniel, when, when um, uh, the vision to Daniel is explained by the, uh, the angel, uh, the, I shouldn't say angels, um, sorry, the malach, the messenger uh, named uh, Gabriel, which means uh, uh, mighty one of, uh, of Yah that he takes the time and says, listen, I want to make sure that you understand what you've just seen. And, and he explains that, that each of these, explain exactly which country each of these represent and how they will materialize and play out in our future with the Torahless One of the Tribulation. And so in um, Revelation, is, Yosha is quoting, uh, is, uh, is uh, providing his testimony to Yahu Kanan. He's doing this very same thing. He says, you know, I want you to make sure that you understand this, because understanding the um, role of Babylon and, uh, and Rome in the uh, worlds today, both past and, uh, and present as well as future, is essential for us understanding um, God's animosity towards religion and politics. And he's still asking us to come out of Babylon, uh, a nation that you know was had been destroyed for uh, 600 years prior to his uh, revelation to Yahukana, which means it's not the Babylon, the country. It's what Babylon represents. Uh, but the all of what he said was an explanation of what Yahweh had already revealed. It is always the answer. You want to know what's going to happen? Read the Torah. Read the prophets. You want to know what has happened? Read the Torah. Read the prophets. If you want the answer, no matter what the question is, if the question has to do with your relationship with God or your salvation, the means to either of those two things, no matter what somebody says, the answer is always found in the Torah. This is, uh, goes on to say, uh, this is, happens to be the, uh, the passage that um, Yosha was uh, citing in this case. It says, and you benefited from his response. This is uh, Moshe speaking with the children of Israel in the wilderness. Um, so it's explaining why Yosha chose that reference. <laughs> and he says, and you benefited from his response, Wa'ana. He answered you in such a way that you could choose to benefit uh, based upon uh, what he was offering, which is why he wanted you to be hungry. He wants you to be hungry because if you're hungry, then you're going to respond to what he's offering, is the message here. And so he could feed you with the manna, which you did not understand. We'll be back. We'll consider more in a moment. When you consider the passage from the Torah that Yahushua cited to explain why he didn't want to consume the aerated bread, which means it was bread that was baked with yeast, why he didn't want to consume the yeast, which he defines as religious and political poison. Uh, the very thing that he came to remove from us, he didn't want to ingest himself. He um, quoted a Torah passage, and it's a Torah passage where Moshe is explaining what God offered 
on behalf of the children of Israel while they were walking through the wilderness. And he's specifically talking about how the children of Israel said they were getting hungry, and uh, God um, was pleased by that because it gave him the opportunity to feed them. And the reason that that story is important is not just because that is the role of a father to uh, to provide nourishment for uh, his children, but because it also explains God's instructions regarding what is good and not good for us to eat. Very, the very word that He chose for the uh, uh, the manna is you ain't got a clue what this is. <laughs> that's, that's basically what they, what manna means. That you ain't got a clue as to what this is. Uh, and you'd, you'd say, well, why would he choose such an odd term? And why would he then conclude this statement that I'm glad you were hungry because I could feed you, which, of course, shows the, the fatherly instinct, is because he says that what you ought to be consuming, if you want to live, feeding upon is every word that comes out of Yahweh's mouth, which you'll find in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, full stop. Now, the reason that that strikes me as being so vitally important is that uh, you know the the religious types want you to believe that the Torah is comprised of laws and that there are food laws for example and that uh, you ought to obey the food laws which means if you want a little pepperoni in your pizza you are really out of luck you want to have a little uh, sea roach tonight a little lobster and no way you want a shrimp cocktail oh my god you are going to go into the penalty box you cannot be saved that's not God's intent at all by concluding that the matzah, which they didn't have a clue what it was, was represented the word of Yahweh, and that we ought to be consuming the word of Yahweh, God is using his discussion on what is good for us to eat and what's not good for us to eat to convey an important message. And the important message is if you consume that which is not from God, you're going to get sick. And if you consume that which is from God, you're going to be healthy, and you're going to live. And so in the food laws, what God distinguishes, not laws, but the food uh, teaching on what's good and not good to eat, you notice that almost everything on the this is not healthy for you is something that either eats garbage, feeds on dead flesh, or doesn't have the proper uh, mechanism for digesting food, uh, what it eats such that it's uh, healthy for um, uh, us. Or it's a, uh, a creature that is prone to debilitating diseases, as a carrier of debilitating diseases, as is the case of, the, uh, of swine. In fact, swine not only eat garbage, but the way they process their, uh, their food, they're particularly prone to carrying um, uh, things that are harmful for us. And so God's saying, if you eat that kind of garbage, if you consume it, then he's going to make you sick. Uh, shrimp and, uh, and lobsters, for example, uh, seafood without gills, they're bottom feeders. And as a bottom feeder, they, uh, they consume the rubbish, the, uh, the trash of the ocean. Uh, vultures, for example, they feed off of the dead flesh. This guy says, don't, don't eat that. That's not good for you. And the things that are good for you is uh, that which I have shared. Feast off my words if you want to live. It's one of a million ways that God underscores the purpose of his Torah teaching, which is to nourish our minds to nourish our bodies, to, to help us grow and be healthy, be restored to life. So here's this uh, statement. And you benefited from his response, well, Anna, which is you, you expressed your hunger and then you benefited from the fact that, that God responded. You benefited from his response, which is why he wanted you to be hungry. Not that he enjoyed them having hunger pains, but when they were hungry, then God could provide for them, which is what he wishes to do for us. 
And so he could feed you with the mana. Mana is from Mon. It's a nourishing and sweet tasting nectar from uh, God, considered to be the bread of life. It's from uh, the Hebrew word ma, which is an interrogative asking, what is this? What does it mean? Ma, ma is an interrogative. So it's the very mana, and the word that it was made up of is, what in the world is this? What does it mean? Because if we question, what does it mean when God is feeding us, when God is saying, here's things that are good for you to eat, things that are not good for you, what does it mean? What, what should we be aware of? What should we question? What is this? Then that's God's way of responding to us so that we can feed on what he has provided, which is his testimony. So, and he could feed you with the manna, which you did not know. Yo, lo, yada, you did not actually understand. You were unaware of what it represents. And also your fathers would have... Uh, not known in order to help you know and understand that indeed it's not upon bread alone shall man continually live and be restored to life but instead indeed rather upon everything that flows out of the mouth of Yahweh shall man continually live and actually be restored to life the purpose of every instruction that is in the Torah isn't to be a law to be obeyed. It is a teaching to be understood. It is guidance that helps us know. And when we view God's word as the most nourishing thing for our souls that helps us continually live and be restored to life, then... We're in a position to capitalize on everything that he said. When you go to swine isn't good for you to eat, full stop, don't go any further, and you gain nothing. You don't know why it's there. I know you. Your diet may uh, be uh, uh, not have any baby back ribs in it or pepperoni sausage. But how is that going to help you understand who God is and what he's offering? If, if you don't want to go beyond do this, don't do that. Now, the Torah was teaching presented to us by our Father to guide our steps so that we could come to know and understand and that we come to realize that what he has shared with us is nourishing. And what man has shared with us, by contrast, can be poisonous. So the, the phrase, the statement that's found in the Torah, that Yosha cited to explain why he wasn't going to eat the yeasted bread, was brilliant. It pointed us to a truth that if Christians would say, you know, I think I'm going to follow his example. I want to follow his example. Then they too would turn to the Torah and look for the nourishing words of God there. But, of course, the founder of the Christian religion says, no, discard that. He even says the Torah can't provide life, and yet here's God himself saying that the words that flow out of his mouth, of Yahweh's mouth, shall cause man to continually live and be restored to life. The citation was from Devarim, a three. Now, unlike Paul, Yosha not only cited the complete statement from the Torah. He didn't take a truncated portion. He said this is the, and he gave him the whole thing, and he pulled it from a discussion which was perfectly suited to affirm God's guidance to answer the specific question being posed. He chose the right verse, and he quoted it entirely, and he quoted it accurately, and the passage actually affirmed the point that Yosha was making. Paul did exactly the opposite. He made the correlation between life and God's testimony, the very 
path through life he himself represents. Since this is important, literally, the means to life and death, and since the contrast between Yahusha and Shaul, Paul, is so considerable, let's examine Dabarim words 8-3 in context. Moshe, the man Yahweh invited to scribe his Torah, the book Shaul has sought to demean and discount, was reminiscing about what they had heard, what they had observed, what they had learned and experienced together over the past 40 years. It was important that they, they recognize that you know, we ought to reflect on this. We've been able to spend this time freed of the religious and political oppression of Egypt and to spend time with our Creator, who is taking care of us as a loving Father. Let's reflect on this. And it begins, all of the terms and conditions, the mitzvah, the codicils of the covenant, which beneficially I have instructed, Shawa, provided by way of directions and guidance this day, for you to genuinely choose and to continuously observe, Shamar, for you to want to closely examine and always carefully consider, electing to consistently and literally focus upon. Now, Shamar here was written in the call stem, which is encourages us to see the relationship between these ideas and for us to interpret what's being conveyed to us literally. That I want you to literally observe, to literally observe. There's only one way you can do that when you're talking about uh, words. And that is to read them with your eyes. That is what observe means in a literal application of the term. Read what has been written. We'll be back in a moment. So Moshe is encouraging the children of Yisrael, which means individuals who engage and endure with God, to reflect on what Yahweh has told, told them. You know, it's, it is a, this is an extremely important concept, folks. Um, if you simply read what God has to say, but you don't bother to reflect on it, it's not going to do a whole lot of good. If you uh, simply listen to what God has to say, but don't bother to make the connections to try to understand, if you don't invest the energy to uh, for understanding, not going to do much good. Now, I tell you, it's better to read what he has to say and to listen to what he has to say than to take the Pauline Christian view and to discard it, to discount it. But still, it's about reflecting upon it, about considering it, that justifies the use of our faculties to observe. But here as we begin this first um, uh, part of this revelation. We come up to Shamar, and we come to realize that it was written in the call stem, which requires a literal interpretation. And there's only one way to literally observe a written text, and that is to read it. Uh, and it was uh, written in the uh, paragogic non-ending, which is a volitional mood. And so God is not commanding us to read it, but encouraging us to read it. He wants us to want to read it. That's the reason why when you're dealing with the terms like the second term here, the first is kol, all of, and then mitzvah is the second. Mitzvah is almost always translated commands or commandments. But if it's a commandment, then, then our free will is irrelevant. Now, if you, if you give a military officer a command, then volition is, uh, is irrelevant. They have to follow the order. You would never combine volition, the paragogic non-ending, with a command. And so one of the challenges of translating from Hebrew into English is to make certain that your definitions of words, your translations, are consistent with the text. And because this happens to be Yahweh, consistent with Yahweh's nature. Here is Yahweh feeding his children. Here is this context, which is 
uh, I have instructed, I have provided instruction, I provided guidance. The, the uh, uh, fourth word here is uh, the Hebrew word uh, shawa, T-S-A-W-A-H. And that is guidance, it's direction, it's teaching. And you, so you'd say, all right, I've got this word mitzvah that the lexicons uh, tell me I ought to translate command, but a command is not a teaching, a command is an order. And so you can't translate a command and use it in the, in the process of an instruction, of a direction, of guidance. And so you're challenged then to look up the word and look up its roots and look up related words and, and to filter out those which are consistent with Yahweh's nature and consistent with the context and filter out those that are inconsistent. Recognizing those that are inconsistent have been layered on by um, religious advocates. So all of the terms and conditions, mitzvah, and when you say a term and a condition, a, a condition is for participation in a relationship. A term is a term of an agreement. So if you have an agreement, it'll have terms. If you have a, a relational document, a relationship document, it's going to have conditions for you, for, for the various parties. And truly, the covenant is a relationship agreement with terms and conditions. And so you... If you're thinking you're going to relate mitzvah, terms and conditions, to the codicils of the covenant. So all of the terms and conditions, the codicils of the covenant, which beneficially, this next word is Asher. And, and we're going through some real detail here, and this may be tough on a radio program to wrap your mind around this, but the reason it's important is this is the very testimony of God. This is the nourishment that God wants us to feed upon. And so it's really important that we convey it as accurately, as completely as possible. Asher is a very important word. It's used thousands of times in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. It, Asher has a definition and it has a function. The definition of Asher is that which is beneficial, that which is fortuitous. And its function is to, is to make a connection between things, to develop a relationship. And so in our program tomorrow, hopefully as early as the second hour, we will consider this testimony, analyzing each of the words so that we glean as much truth as, as absolutely possible and are completely nourished by the testimony of Yahweh.